Shabbat Shalom to all of you and welcome to the extra of our Erev Shabbat Parasha, part of the Kadima project with uh, the Vash magazine, our first fruit of the project that uh, is going to see the printing a version of the Devash magazine soon. So we invite you all, um, those of you which want to participate and join us in the program, in Academy pro uh, Project, and to support us in the printing of the Vash magazine, to contact us at contact at makaseshatikva.org. So let's go through the Parsha. The Parsha, Bereshit is the first parsha of the Torah portion reading of the entire year. So it's a really important uh, parsha that we want to study together. And you can receive your uh, Bora Torah every week on a Thursday via email in your inbox as a PDF with all of the activities, part of the Vash magazine and the quizzes and uh, games. You can share your uh, the Vash magazine copy as a PDF with your family. You cannot distribute the, the Vash magazine to other people rather than the ones which are belonging to the Kadima project and the students at the um, Eder Malva Italia. And this is a product that has been freely um, distributed within Eder Malva Italia and the Vash magazine is uh, a tool that can help our children to learn Torah in a sweet and marvelous, simple way. So I invite you to uh, respond via email and also to request your copy in your inbox. So you can to dedicate a Parsha or any other section of the Vash magazine in honor or in memory of someone close to you. For further information, you can contact us at contact at makaseshatikva.org. So today, the Aftora, that is the additional portion from Prophets, which is read after the reading of our Parsha, comes from the prophet Yeshayahu, that is the prophet Isaiah, chapter 42, verse 5, through chapter 43, verse 10. This is for the Ashkenazim. And then for the Sephardim, it's always coming from Yeshayahu, the prophet, uh, that is Isaiah, chapter 42, verse 5, till the verse 21. So it's a bit shorter than the portion Ashkenazim read. And uh, this is a Shabbat Mevachim Kodesh Mar Keshvan. So we'll have Rosh Kodesh on a Tuesday and Wednesday, October 25th and 26th. That is the beginning of the Hebrew month. And it's important to celebrate it all together with our family so let's look at the Parsha and let's see how many mitzvot we have in this Parsha. We have just one mitzvot and it's a mitzvah ase, that means that is a positive commandment, 146 pesukim or sentences, nine, uh, thousand, sorry, 1,931 number of words and 7,235 letters. I'll trade you one Big Bang for six days of creation. So it, this is the beginning. Yeah, it's a big inning. And you got box seats to witness the creation of our world and the universe in this exciting episode of the Vash magazine. So let's speak at the Parsha. I'll trade you one big bang for six days of creation. So we are going to speak about the creation and how Hashem made heaven and earth, and earth at the beginning of time. So as we look at the Parsha, we have um, a king. There was a, once a king. 
wanted to build a palace. So in this Parsha, we discover more about who is Hashem and how he created us and the entire universe. Now, what do you suppose this king did first? A palace needs bricks, right? So he called a mason who asked, how many bricks do you need? And the king did not know. So a palace needs windows. But when the glazier asked how large they were supposed to be and where they should go, the king did not know. How tall must the ceiling be? How... Mm, in our last uh, episode, if you remember, the spy conspiracy let loose the Lashon Aura and pushed back the grand entry into Eretz Israel by 40 years. So we have been having a great delay because of Lashon Aura. So when we speak negatively about something or someone, this is going to cause a delay in our healing, in our deliverance, in our blessing, in our lives, because of that. So let's watch our mouth. And the builder, or I would say, yes, one of the builders say says to the king, any stairs will there be? So the king still did not know what to answer. Now the king realized what he must do. He called an architect who then designed the palace and drew it on a paper called a blueprint. So when we have a blueprint, then we can realize where things go. But we, if we do not have a blueprint, we cannot really understand how things are going to be. And once the king had the blueprint, he could see the entire structure before him and answer all the questions that the builders had asked. So Hashem, too, had a blueprint when he created the world, the Torah. And for each commandment in the Torah, Hashem created a way to fulfill that mitzvah. And the Torah teaches us the commandment to eat kosher. Eat kosher means adequate. So it means that we are, um, we are eating in an adequate way that is conformed to Hashem's will. For us to be healthy, to be purified, to be consecrated, never to be sick. And... We have to pay attention to what we eat because it's important that we keep our uh, body healthy and fit for the will of the Lord is to see us healed, delivered from sickness. We are not supposed to be in a hospital, but as we do, we will find ourselves to take medications upon medications, and this is not the will of God. The will of God is for us to be free from medications, free from any kind of worldly strategies to be healed, but just to be healthy. So eating well is a secret of life. Amen. And so Hashem, Hashem created kosher animals, so adequate animals which were supposed to be eaten from us without giving us any sort of, um, I would say, bad consequences. Because there are animals which can really harm us and cause us um, sickness and infections, and we don't want that. That's why there is a list of animals we have to eat, and there is a list of animals we're not supposed to, but we will go through it in a time. So the Torah says to honor your father and mother. So Hashem created a world in which parents and children could live and follow his mitzvot in a wonderful, balanced, and pure relationship. Let's talk about the creation. The creation, day one, 
on the first day of creation, Hashem makes a double play, creating the heavens and the earth. But there is chaos on the field. So the earth and heaven and heaven teams fumble around. Well, that's about to be fixed, right? So we don't want to see chaos. So Hashem doesn't want to. And Hashem just flipped on the world's light switch with the declaration, let there be light. And here we see the evidence, the evidence of his love for us. He doesn't want us to be confused and in chaos, but he wants us to be in the light of his countenance, of his messianic redemption that comes through Moshiach Yeshua, Moshiach Ben David, who is the light, the way, and the truth. And it was at the time of creation as part of Elohim, that is the plural of El. So the Elohim, Hashem, Moshiach, Yeshua, and the Ruach HaKodesh were all together creating and giving the light to the world. And so Elohim said, let there be light. Hashem calls the light day and the darkness night. And at the end of one inning, the creation's course applies to this first day. So day two, what happens in the day two? On the second day, Hashem is umpire of the empire, separating team heaven and team earth. The heavens head up and the earth sticks to the home field. And now, in the day three, the problem with earth is that it is all wet, right? There was no separation between the water of up uh, and the water below. So there was no separation. And we had heaven and earth just attached to one another. But God didn't want that. He wanted to let them be separated. So day three, the problem with earth is that it is all wet. <laughs> so water, water everywhere. Just when you think the game's gonna be rained out, Hashem makes a big splash with dry land. That's right. The waters separate into oceans, seas, rivers, lakes, and streams. And with the water out of the way, what happens? The earth, sprouts grass and trees, beautiful flowers, gardens, and a personal favorite of the boss, Gan Eden. Gan Eden is the Garden of Eden. So the Gan Eden, Gan in Hebrew is garden, it means garden. And the Garden of Eden is the beginning of all that we remember yeah when we when it comes to the creation of men so that's wrap for day number three and i think it was enough day four the fourth inning as creation seeing stars up in heavens that is you know, there there will be stars and there will be sun and the moon and all the planets. And Hashem high pops the sun, moon, planets, and stars into the sky. Can you imagine? He was just <laughs> spreading them in the sky. Day five, Hashem turns back to the field in the fifth creating insects. We don't like insects, but they're really useful. Birds and fish. Superfish Leviathan makes a brief appearance before being thrown out of the game for hopping the field. 
But Torah fans can get a piece of it at the feast for scholarly ticket holders in Olamaba. Day six, it's a six inning game, and at the top of the sixth, Hashem brings out the beasts lions, tigers, elephants, and all other animals. There is a population explosion on the field as the cattle take a bite out of the asphalt. In the bottom of the sixth, there is a grand slam honor as Hashem creates men from the dust of the earth. That's where we came from. We came from the dust of the earth. And we should remember about it. This should give us more humility. Yeah? We are nothing but dust. And we will be back to the dust. But our souls and spirit will be with him in the kingdom of heaven. So... Man's the man. Now that the world is created, Hashem huddles with the malachim, yeah, with the angels, to discuss the peace, the resistance. The highlight of all creation. Who are they talking about? Well, they are speaking of man. The malachim, the angels, are not too keen on the idea, though is not going to be perfect, is going to sin and blow the whole balance of the world. Why make a bad investment, they say. But in this stadium, Hashem makes the final calls. Man is the plan. So on the first day of Tishrei, the sixth day of creation, Hashem forms man's body and he gathers dust from all four corners of the earth and places it on Har Amoria, that is the Mount Moria, the future site of the Mishbayak, the altar in the Beit Amikdash, where the holy sacrifices would have been done. And the first man is named Adam. Adam, because he comes from the earth. Yeah, he comes from the word, the Hebrew word Adama, that means earth. Hashem breathes the breath of life, the spirit of life, yeah, the Ruach HaKodesh, and an ash, and <laughs> Nishama, that is a soul, is made into Adam, and the still body comes to life. So without the breath, the breath of life, the Ruach HaKodesh in us, we couldn't have a soul. We couldn't have a neshama. That's why it's important to recognize that every breath we take comes from the Lord Almighty. Yeah, from Hashem. Hashem places Adam into Gan Eden, into the Garden of Eden. In English, Eden, <laughs> where it will live forever. So the men were supposed to live eternally. Men were supposed to not have any form of death. There was no death in the beginning. But Hashem knew him. Hashem knew the spirit that would fight against the Ruach HaKodesh in him. So if he can keep just one commandment, man will live forever. But the rest of the story doesn't go that way. So for six days, Hashem has created the heavens and the earth. On the seventh, he rests. I always imagine Hashem having a bath, a mikvah, yeah, or a shower. But I, I guess he had a mikveh. There was much time. So he rests. That's what the idea of Shabbat comes from. Because of the day the Lord had made. 
the seventh day, the day of rest, of Shabbat. That's all Shabbat is about. Six days a week, we go back and forth, we work, we study, we struggle, we fight with our survival throughout the days, working and playing and doing lots of stuff, which might be not very important, but allows us to survive and doing what it takes to live in this world. But by the time the sun set on Friday night, the hustle and bustle of the world is put behind us and the Shabbat celebration surrounds us. So on Shabbat, we do not perform any work. We don't, we don't want to even talk about work, right? So instead, we proclaim that Hashem is the master of all creation. And if you look carefully at the Parsha, you will find part of the Kiddush, the blessing of the vine, of the wine, I'm sorry, <laughs> that we recite on Shabbat before having our meal all together after the service. And this reminds us that Hashem is the one true God, creator of the universe. So let's speak now about spare reap. In the garden, in Gan Eden, Adam's first job is to name all the animals. It's not an easy job to find a name for each one of them. There are so many. So two by two, the male and female of each species passes before Adam. He names them first in Lashon HaKodesh, and then in all the other 70 future languages of the world. As he performs this monumental task, Adam realizes that he is the only creature in the world who's missing a mate. He's alone. He doesn't have any companion, right? He doesn't feel that right. So good observation, Adam. Hashem says it's not good thing for man to be alone. Giving Adam a companion has been Hashem's plan all along. So here's the proof. Hashem's got 13 ribs. We only got 12. Hashem places Adam into a deep sleep and he removes that 13 rib from Adam and creates Chava, Eve, the first female, Adam's mate, his wife, recite on Shabbat. And this reminds us that Hashem is the one true God, creator of the universe. And as for every Arab Shabbat, when we start our celebration, we also recite a beautiful song, that comes from the Proverbs 31 that describe the woman of valor. Yeah, uh, and we're going to give uh, you a glimpse of the beautiful idea that Hashem had when created men and women. So all in a day's work. There is only one mitzvah for Adam to observe in Gan Eden, in the Garden of Eve, of Eden. He is commanded not to eat from the eights adaat, that is, the tree of good and evil. So if he can pull this off for one day, Adam and his descendants will live forever. If he or Chaba blow it, they will die, simply enough. Hmm? Well, we will see about that. There is one more character in this garden, seen the snake. I don't like snakes. Don't at all. <laughs> and this is no ordinary snake, because at the beginning of creation, snake could walk and talk. 
Why is walking up to Chava right now? The snake placed it innocent. Did Hashem tell you not to eat any of the fruit of the garden? The snake asks. Chava responds, we can eat fruit from any tree, but the one at the center of the garden, why my husband Adam told me we're not even allowed to touch it. That's the kind of intro the snake's been waiting for. He knows that Hashem never, ever commanded Adam not to touch the tree. Yeah, a Satan is smart. But Chava, Chava doesn't know that. So she doesn't know that. The snake shows her against the tree of knowledge. It's a miracle. She doesn't die. She doesn't die. So this doesn't make sense to Chava. If she didn't die from touching the tree, maybe her dear husband was lying to her about eating from the tree. Well, she will just have to try this out. So Chava picks a fruit from the eights at the at and bites into it. Then she runs over to Adam and gives him a taste. Worst. As soon as they take a bite of that forbidden fruit, Adama, Adam, I'm sorry, and Chava change. They change internally. Yes, something has changed. And the Yetzer Hora enters their bodies. They are now true human beings in the worst way, no longer perfect no longer eternal. Suddenly, Hashem calls out. Hashem always calls us, yeah? <laughs> when he knows we've done something wrong. And he calls out to the two. Where are you? He perfectly know where they are. But just like a father knows his children have been wrong, he just calls them and say, where are you? Adam and Chava foolishly try to hide among the trees. Not very smart. Of course, there is no hiding from Hashem. We cannot hide from Hashem. Now Adam and Chava both know that they should never ever have eaten the forbidden fruit. But instead of admitting their mistake, I would call it pride, and doing chuba, asking for forgiveness, they play the blame game. Yeah, that's the usual blame game. Adam blames it all on Chava, and Chava blames the snake, and this is not a good move. All Hashem wanted was to hear, I'm sorry. Now, Adam, Chava, and the snake will be punished for their sin. Do the crime, do the time. First, the snake's punishments. Believe it or not, the snake originally had arms and legs and could talk. Hashem decreased that from now on, all snakes will, will crawl on their bellies and speak snake's language. That is... It's not very creative. The original plan was for the snake to be greater than all other animals. It was supposed to be a servant to mankind and attach itself to the mitzvot of Adam like Eliezer did as a servant to Abraham. Now the snake would be lower than all other animals. So the snake's skin will shed once every seven years, and oy vey, will it hurt. All food will now taste like dust to the snake, even pizza. Men will have a natural hatred toward the snake. The snake will become a mortal being and die. What do you want more? 
enough already. So next, Hashem turns to Chava. For listening to the snake, eating from the tree of knowledge and feeding the fruit to Adam, Chava, eternal life is taken away. She will die like a mortal being. Her children will cause her pain. Finally, Adam is punished. Of course, he loses his eternal life. Originally, all food grew from the ground naturally. Can you imagine? We didn't have to work the ground. Now, men will have to till the soil and sweat it out to earn his bread. So, let's speak about spare the reed. In the garden, as we have seen, we have witnessed the creation of men, women, and the snake. Now, how can we get lost? Hashem takes the shedded skin of the snake and sew some nifty clothes for two, I'm sorry, uh, so, I'm sorry, some nifty clothes for his two fallen stars to wear. Then Hashem gives the two the boot. Adam and Chava are forced to leave Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden. From now on, they are on their own. That's really sad. Two Malachim with flaming swords are placed at the garden's gate to keep them out. And that's the story. The beginning of creation of men and women. The first man and the first woman on earth were already sinners. It didn't take that much, less than one day. So... Let's speak about Ethan family. In the garden, Adam's first job to name all animals two by two. So the male and female of each, each species passes before Adam. He names them. And he speaks first in Lashon Akodesh, but also in the 70 future languages of the world. Then he realizes he's alone. He wants to have a companion. Hashem gives him a companion. And so the family is instantly, instantaneously, I'm sorry, created. So the ultimate sacrifice on the 14th of Nisan, Adam gathers up his two sons. So here we see that in the Torah, we have, uh, strange timing from the first day of creation we now see Adam having two songs it means that some days have been passed by right and these two songs are not that little <laughs> they are grown up children so Adam gathers up his two songs and explains to them that in the future the Jews will offer korbanot in this day on this day, on the 14th of Nisan. So, well, as you can imagine, there isn't that much to do being one of only seven people in the entire world. And this is a traditional belief of the Talmud and the traditional Jewish beliefs, okay? That there were already seven people. It means that not only Adam and Eve and Chava were alive, but they did not only have two sons, but more. Amen. And so we had Cahin and Hevel, which were the two, the first two sons, each decide to offer this korban, this sacrifice to Hashem. But what happened was that Cahin picked flaxseed. Now, out of all the stuff that grows on the cane plantation, he could have chosen something better. So he chose flaxseed. Come on, you could chose something 
much more attractive. So flaxseed is the most inferior type of offer offering you can give to Hashem to honor him. So Cain places this flaxseed on the Mishbayah, fully expecting Hashem to burn it up with his heavenly fire, but it doesn't happen. The heavenly fire is a no-show. Next, Hevel. Abel gives it a shot. He takes a different approach. He offers up his best lamb on the Mishbayah. Poof! The heavenly fire zaps the Corban, and Hebel has scored big time in the Corban portion of the competition. Of course, Cain is truthfully embarrassed by the situation. First, the extra twin, because even though we know, we do not know about their age, in the Jewish tradition, it's believed they were twins, and now flanking the heavenly fire. The brothers began to brawl. Cain grabs a rock and takes pot shots at his brother. The arm, the leg, the elbow, he tries them all. There has got to be a way to kill Hebel. So in Cain's uh, will, in Cain's evil spirit, fighting with the Ruach Kodesh, there was a will to kill his brother. He was just looking for the right part to be broken in his body. Doesn't martyr come with instructions? Nope. Finally, Cain lacks out and hits Hebel right smack on the head. That's it. Hebel drops on the ground, dead. And what happens next? Now, let's not forget that rage is new to Cain. Now, no one in the world has ever martyred anyone before. There are no rules here. So what should he, where should he go? What should he do? And where can he go? He wants to run away. Who can he turn to before Cain can do something? Hashem, as he did with his parents, appears. Where is your brother, Hebel? We see that Hashem makes questions which are very generic, like he wants us to answer in an appropriate way. So he just asks, where is your brother, Hebel? Like he doesn't know that he's dead. But he does. So Hashem asks, instead of admitting his mistake as his parents did, Cain tries to think up and just alibi, we say. Well, if Cain's not the best liar, he's certainly a top notch philosopher. Cain comes up with one of the top 10 family quotes at all time Am I my brother's keeper? What sort of question is it? Good quote, bad move. What does Cain think? That Hashem does not see Hebel lying dead on the ground, just there? Well, Hashem explains to Cain in that by murdering his brother, he not only killed Hebel, but he also killed all the Hebel's unborn descendants. Generations to generations were killed through this killing, this murder. As a punishment, Cain is doomed to wander the earth for the rest of his life. He will never be allowed to settle down and will never find true peace. The moment he rests, people will terrorize him. He will be forced to move on. Furthermore, when Cain dies, he will not be buried like a mensch, like, uh, uh, I would say, a man of valor or somebody who blesses others or a tzaddik, a right person. Cain cannot take this kind of pressure 
But what can he do about it? Then it hits him. Tshuva. He understands what is meant to be done. He admits to his sin and asks Hashem for mercy. Amazingly, Hashem accepts Cain's atonement and gives Cain a little leeway. He places a sign on Cain's head, a warning to animals and people of future generations to steer clear of this marked man. Additionally, Hashem delays Cain's death. He promises not to punish Cain for seven generations. So how Cain dies? Seven generations pass, the world has been populated by Cain the nomad and his descendants. One of those great, great grand descendants is Tuval Cain. He escorts his blind father Lemech on a hunting trip. In the distance, Tuval Cain spots a wild animal. He helps his father aim the ball in the right direction. Lemek draws his weapon and takes a shot. It's a bull's eye. When they approach the so-called animal, they see it is Cain lying dead on the ground. It wasn't a bull. The blind Lemek cries out in anguish. He claps his hands together and Tuval Cain's head gets crushed between the blind man's powerful palms. Can you imagine how big they were? Now two men are dead. Not only Cain, but also is descended to Vul Cain, seventh generation of the Cain clan. With his death, the line of Cain is wiped out. It doesn't exist anymore. So, generating the generations, well, Cain may not have been a Corban contender or much of a liar, but that Shuva idea is a hit. It was a great idea. Eventually, Adam decides to follow in Cain's footsteps. He leaves his wife to do top-notch Shuva in solitude. 130 years later, Adam returns. Wow, just a little time. He and Chava have a third son. They name Shait. Shait grows up to be a righteous man. Throughout the years, as Cain's descendants go down the idle highway, Shait's descendants manage to turn out a few good eggs. Among them, Noah, a 10th generation descendant, becomes the brightest star of his time. And his name, Noah, meaning comforter or comforter, describes his inventive spirit. Until his time, life is pretty tough for farmers. Even wheat grows with thorns attached. And imagine farm animals constantly rebelling against their masters. At this changes with the birth of Noah. He is an inventor. He builds the first plow share. Sickle and spade is a tzaddik, is a right man is a righteous man who stands out as the greatest man of his generation, but more about him next week. So let's speak about this generation gap. Adam lives to be 930 years, a long time. When Adam and Chava die, Hashem buries them in the cave of Machpelah. This is believed as a part of Jewish tradition. And we'll talk about it and more in the next Parsha Chaye Sarah. From Adam to Noah, there are 10 generations. Okay, 10 generations pass, and each generation brings the world down a notch in terms of years. 
they have been living. Adam he starts out as the perfect man, he is built to live forever on the condition that he keeps his hands off the forbidden fruit, but he's not able to. So in a matter of hours, Adam blows his immortality and every creature that is born is doomed to die. Sha'it, as a saint himself, is okay, but is surrounded by a generation of Chaim's descendants who aren't exactly the best influence on mankind. Enosh, his generation comes out with the bright idea of worshipping the sun, the moon, the stars, out of respect for Hashem. Bad move. That's called idolatry. Hashem doesn't like that. As a warning, Hashem floods one third of the world. Canaan, this wise and mighty leader, tries to put his generation on the right path, but it doesn't work. Machalel lives for 895 years. Not a short life. Yered, another tzaddik, surrounded by an evil generation. Hanok, Hanok separates himself from the rest of the world. We call it Enoch. He concentrates on tefillah and improving himself as a servant of Hashem. He's one of a few people who enter Gan Eden Olamaba alive. Masushelach, that is Matusalem, <laughs> is the tzaddik, is the righteous of his time and the record holder for the longest lifespan of all time. 969 years. He spends his life warning people that if they do not make a major change, a flood will wipe them out. Of course, no one listens. Lamech, not the same one who kills Cain. In his time, a worldwide famine hits, but mankind doesn't catch the warning. Hashem's patience is running out. Time on Noah. Noah finally, Hashem decides that the people of the world are too corrupted to fix. It's time to change something. Only Noah and his family deserve to leave. So Hashem declares that he will bring a flood and wipe out mankind. Only Noah and his family will survive. But how? Well, tune in and next week when Hashem gives Noah the plans to build the largest floating wildlife conservatory in history in the next exciting episode of The Vash Magazine and Kadima Project. But before we finish, let's take a look to the Midrash. Well, one of the first tasks that the first man was given was to give names to all the animals of the earth. One by one, they passed before him. With his great intelligent, intelligence, Adam was able to understand that each animal had a particular outstanding characteristic. Adam chose a name that reflected that characteristic. For example, a donkey's nature is dull and heavy and earthy quality. So he named the donkey Hamor, which means earthly. Adam understood that a horse has a bragging joyfulness when galloping into battle. He therefore named the horse Sus, which means rejoice. Adam realized that the lion is the king of the beasts. In the future, prophets would compare Hashem to a lion. Adam combined the letters Yud, He, and Aleph from the name of Hashem with the letter Reish. From the word Ruach of or spirituality. So the lion was named Hariyeh. Finally, the first man was asked 
by a sham. What will you call your shell? The man replied, Adam, from the word Adoma, earth, for he was created from the dust of the earth. And what is my name? asked Hashem. Adonai, master, for you are master of all creatures. And before we finish, let's pray. Avinu Malkenu, our father, our king, we thank you for your creation, for you have created us in your image, and you have given us a great reward through your redemption in Moshiach Yeshua, to be forever and ever with you in your presence in Olamaba, in a kingdom of heaven and worship you in spirit and truth. Let us today repent from all of our sins, recognizing we are sinners. So you might forgive us and step forward with you in the kingdom of heaven. In Moshiach ben David, Moshiach Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Shavua talk to all of you and blessings in Moshiach Ben David.